Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning we continue in a sermon series we've been doing for the last few weeks uh, about families. We've called it uh, Family Issues of Biblical Proportions. And we've talked about the many scandalous families in scripture, including those found in Jesus' genealogy. And we have been reminded that even through their scandal, God used them to bring about the Messiah. In the same way, God can use our own messes to bring about God's messages. Last week, Pastor Bill reminded us how hard it is to be siblings and that we must be careful not to foster sibling rivalry within our own families. And we've talked about practical things like learning to listen and constantly relearning our families and our role within them and about the need for forgiveness. This week, it was my, um, our original intention was to talk about mental illness in families, but we're bringing in... Um, a trained counselor to do that, and because of some schedule uh, mishaps, she now can't come to June, until June. So we had to fit in uh, an extra sermon in the series in order to make the schedule work. So we um, had decided to talk about um, broken families, and I wanted to spend some time talking about divorce and what that means within the church, and I wanted to talk about the new way our families are structured, But I didn't want to do that by being another pastor who stands up and rails against what we all know is already happening anyway. So so as I was spending some time looking at the data this week, uh, it took a little bit of a different turn than from when I named it to be about broken families at the beginning of the week. So let me just tell you first about some of the statistics I read this week. According to a study done um, by Pew Research, 15% of children are living with two parents who are both remarried. Now, it's hard to measure this piece with census data alone, but there is one survey that indicates that 6% of all children are living with a step-parent. And one of the largest shifts we can look at over the last couple years is this, that 34% of children today live with an unmarried parent, which is up from just 9% in 1960 and 19% in 1980. In most cases, those um, unmarried parents are single, but there's a small share of all children, about 4, 4%, who are living with two cohabitating parents, because uh, there's especially a lot of um, people in my generation who are choosing not to get married for various reasons. The remaining 5% of children are not living with either parent. In most cases, they are living with a grandparent uh, or another member of their family, a phenomenon that has become much more prevalent since the most recent economic downturn. When we were living in West Virginia, we were serving a very rural community um, out um, in Morgan County. And at one point, the youth leaders and I looked around. We didn't have as large a youth group as we do here. But we looked around and realized at one point that there was not a single one of our youth members, not a single one, who were living with their family of origin. Some of them were living with one parent. Some of them were living with one parent but had been adopted by their their stepmom or their adopted mom. Others were living with parents that were divorced or remarried. But most of them were living with their grandparents. In some cases, this was because their parents had um, passed away, but in many cases, it was because their parents were in jail or in drug treatment rehab programs. I would say probably about five out of seven of our youth in West Virginia lived with their grandparents. And that's, it's not just there that that happens. There is study after study that confirms that the number one predictor of life satisfaction comes from spending time with people that you care about and with people who also care about you. That's the number one predictor of life satisfaction. Another way to put that more simply is that happiness is other people. And the other people that we hang around with most is our families. So family is central to our own happiness and to the happiness of our children. There was a 2010 Pew study that found that three quarters of adults said that their family was the most important element of their lives. The same number said that they were very satisfied with their family life, and eight out of 10 said the family they have today is as close or closer than the one they grew up in, which I think says something good. As you become an adult, uh, grow into that family life, if you think it's closer than it was when you were children, I think that says something really good about the way um, your family works. 
So that's the good news. But the bad news is that everyone feels completely overwhelmed by the pace of our lives today. Survey after survey after survey shows that both children and parents will list stress as the number one concern. Now that includes stress inside the home as well as stress from outside the home. Even children as young as four will list stress as their number one concern. There are studies that show that parental stress can weaken children's brains. It depletes their immune systems, and it increases the risk for obesity, mental illness, diabetes, allergies, and even tooth decay. I mean, think about that for a minute. Your stress as a parent can increase your child's risk for tooth decay. There's probably a lot we could say about why that is. And I think that stress is magnified in homes where there is only one parent struggling to keep all of the balls rolling, to keep the calendar going with no one else to help. And when there are families that are split by divorce and have to go back and forth between more than one household, it is so much more to keep track of that it can begin to feel overwhelming. So what do we do with all of that data? Well, As I was thinking about it this week, the passage from Ecclesiastes came to mind. If you'll remember, a number of months ago, we did a sermon series called Mythbusters, where we looked at Christian cliches, and I told you my number one least favorite cliche is everything happens for a reason. It grates at me when people say that. I know that we all mean it with good intentions, but we don't think about what we're really saying when we say that, which is um, not all the time a good thing. And I don't think that phrase holds up in scripture. I think instead what we see in scripture is that everything happens for a season. And that's what we hear in this Ecclesiastes passage. There is a season for everything, a time for everything under the heavens. I think I told you about the um, storybook that we had when the girls first came in that has beautiful pictures um, of of this scripture passage. And it has that refrain, there is a a time for everything under heavens uh, and a... Now I've forgotten the way that they did it. A time for everything under the heavens and a purpose for everything or something. Anyway, uh, and we began to read it. Now when Ivy and Eva first moved in with us, um, Ivy was, had just begun to learn how to read but was not a very strong reader. And so, um, so it was difficult. But she loved this book because it had these beautiful pictures in it, but the, the words were really hard. So, um, so the longer we read it, she would pick that book out to read every night, probably because we only had like three or four children's books when they moved in with us too, so she didn't have much to choose from. But she would pick out this book and we would read it every, uh, every time so that by the end, when she moved from our family to another foster family, she couldn't read the whole thing, but she knew uh, the phrase, everything happened, there's a, a reason for, there's a time for everything under the heavens, is what it said. There's a time for everything under the heavens. If you ask her, if you start it, she could probably still finish it today, though don't test her because then I'll be wrong and, and you'll all make fun of me. Now, I think this scripture is true also in families, and it's important for us to remember. There's a friend of mine gave me parenting advice, which I think was the most helpful piece of advice I've ever received. And she said this, it is helpful to remember that everything is afraid, is a phase. Everything is a phase. Not sleeping through the night, it's a phase, it will pass. Not taking a nap anymore, it's a phase, it will pass. Not eating their vegetables, it's a phase, it will pass. Won't speak in anything other than a monosyllable, it's a phase, it will pass, and something new will come along. That goes right along with what the author of Ecclesiastes would said. And sometimes, I think we like to think that we are the only parent going through something, or that this is the first time in the history of the world that this has ever happened to any child with any parent. We all have friends who parent like that. But I think it's helpful for us to remember that there is nothing new under the sun and that every parent before us has gone through this phase with their child. And it's also helpful for us to remind our children that things happen for a season, that there will be good days and there will be bad days. There will be time to tear apart and time to heal. There will be time to be silent and time to speak. But we do them all as a family. Our gospel passage from Mark reminds us also that there is nothing beyond God's redemption. Not unclean spirits, not people with illnesses lasting for years, not even a broken family is beyond God's redemption. It can be redeemed and healed when we give it over to God because the truth is that none of us have to be broken forever. 
We may take detours from the lives we thought we would lead. We may take a different path than God originally intended or wanted for us, the same way our children often do, but we are never beyond God's love or redemption, and neither are our families. So what is the practical takeaway today? How do we teach our children that nothing is beyond God's redemption or that there will be ups and downs in life, but we do them together as a family? Well, there was a recent wave of research that showed that children who eat dinner with their families are less likely to drink, smoke, do drugs, get pregnant, commit suicide, and develop eating disorders. They also found that children who enjoy family meals have larger vocabularies, better manners, healthier diets, and higher self-esteem. Now, this is the one that got me the most. There was a comprehensive survey done by the University of Michigan. And their report looked at how American children spent their time between 1981 and 1997. So this was years ago, but still. They discovered that the amount of time children spent eating meals at home was the single biggest predictor for better academic achievement and fewer behavioral problems. Meal time was more influential than time spent in school, time spent studying, attending religious services, or playing sports. Meal time. So even with all that data, though, and with celebrity endorsements, you hear more and more about families, uh, celebrity families who have family meals. There are fewer and fewer families who are eating together because we just don't have the time. Our schedules are so pulled by sports and church activities and play practice and music lessons and practices and games that we have no time to sit together all together at a meal. Sometimes even just once a week is hard to do. So what do we do? I was reading a book this week called Happier Families, and uh, they had uh, lots, a list of over 200 suggestions for how you can be a, a happier family. And their suggestion around dinner time was this, get creative. If you don't have time for dinner, try eating family breakfast together. Maybe all of you can eat a bowl of cereal before you go to school or work. If you don't have time for family dinner, try eating earlier. They talked about one family that eat their family dinner at 4 o'clock um, before all of them go to various sports practices, and then they come home and eat dessert together at 8.30 before everybody goes to bed. If you don't have time for um, dinner, try just eating a bunch of small snacks together. Even just sitting down for a few minutes to have a snack is better than having no time at all together around the table. Because here's the thing. The meal together has little to do with what you eat or what time you eat it, but rather has more to do with the ritual of having it and with the conversation that happens around the table. We know this to be true in our own faith as well, right? Because we have the communion table. And it doesn't matter what kind of bread we eat at the communion table. It doesn't matter whether it's Welch's grape juice or some other brand of grape juice or if you're at another church and they serve wine. What matters is that we all gather together at the table and that we do it in, in a way with such a ritual that we all know what it means when we gather at the table. I've told some of you before that um, when I was working at the nursing home that there would be um, folks with Alzheimer's who wouldn't remember who they were in one moment, but the moment that you started the communion liturgy, they knew all of it, every word. And they would know when to stretch out their hand to receive the elements, and they would know the prayer of thanksgiving to stay afterward, because that ritual was so ingrained in them. Our family meals work the same way. Our conversation around the table should be about what it means to have ups and downs in life, that there is a season for everything and a time for everything under the heavens. Our meals together, our snacks, our breakfasts, our dinner, should be about reminding us that none of us are beyond God's redemption, because that's the connection that happens at the table. Maybe today you are someone whose marriage didn't work out as you intended it, or whose relationships have been broken, sometimes not by our choices, but by the choices of others. Maybe you're someone who feels like your family is a little more dis dysfunctional than most. Or maybe you are the child of someone who is divorced or the child of a single parent, and you are still struggling, even as an adult, with the pain from that. Well, here is God's word for you today. There is redemption, and there is healing, and that healing comes at the table. So as a family, as the family of God, let us gather around our table and eat our family meal. The word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God.